morning, Chris. Good morning. Glad to have you back with us. Morning, Dane. Glad you're with us. Your topics are going to come up today, I hope. And uh, good morning, Larry. Good morning, everyone. And Dave is joining us momentarily. Happy uh, birthday, Sensei. <laughs> <clears throat> Get my volume up. There we are. Okay. What you got there, Dave? Ah, birthday. Okay. <laughs> it's a what? He, he's uh, he's playing happy birthday. Here you go. It comes again, Cincy. <laughs> I can't hear it. You, you have to just imagine it. Oh, imagine it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's better than, the small viol better than the small violin. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Anyway, okay, let's. Uh, <clears throat> first, Rock, accept my apologies for getting on late. Uh, for some reason, Zoom decided I needed to use a password this morning. And, uh, the wonders of technology. Uh, anyhow, um, we have a couple of, I think, relatively simple topics first, then we're going to get probably into Dane's good stuff. Uh, and uh, what else do I need to mention? Um, I have an updated website up as of this morning. Um, there are some pages that need some fixing, but Kimberly, my daughter, is going to take care of that. <clears throat> After this weekend, she has a 5 or 10K run somewhere in California, so she's off for that. Anyway, um, first question today is... <clears throat> Is there a difference between a dojo and a club? Is either a gym? And how does this quote unquote terminology affect what we do or how our students perceive of what they're learning, I guess? <laughs> so, um, anybody want to start with it? So, I'll take a stab. Um, <laughs> so, to me, I feel like, at least historically, a club would mean you don't have a sensei at that location, right? Like a club would be somebody like learned a martial art, got to like a brown belt, but their sensei is in like a certain town, right? Like they train at the sensei's dojo, then they go back to their hometown and they're the only person who knows any martial art. So they have a club, but they don't have an actual, like that person at the club can't give rank. It's through like another sensei, right? Like if you had like a, a group of people who don't really have a sensei training together, that would be a club, right? I think as soon as you have an actual sensei in that club, it's a dojo. Okay. Anybody want to make, have a different definition? Well, one is one is a Japanese term, right? And the other one's an English term. So I think that's where we get in trouble um, is, is when we compare it. You know, a dojo is what I mean, what does it mean literally a place of the way? So there is a there is a intention, a purpose behind the place. There's there's sometimes even a spiritual aspect, you know, to it. So even a church can be called a dojo you know, in, in Japan. Um, so it's, it's very intentional. It's very purposeful. Uh, and it's clear to what you're trying to accomplish there. Um, you know, a club is, is an English word and it could mean, you know, a country club <laughs> could mean a motorcycle club. And it's, it's more of a, you know, a place where, 
Uh, I mean, it doesn't even have to be a place. You know, you can form a club without actually having a place. You know, like uh, I've been in car clubs before and, you know, enthusiast type of clubs. And uh, and sometimes you just you're on a forum. Sometimes you're just uh, getting together and hanging out. Other times you're doing an activity, uh, you know, so whether there's a, a sensei or not, you know, to me is is less um uh, less critical as far as putting a label on it so i think it comes back to what you're trying to accomplish you know with with that group uh but a dojo is an actual place you know it doesn't exist in the cloud i, I know we have virtual dojos now and stuff you know <laughs> but but, it, but it's an actual it's meant to be an actual a place where a club doesn't necessarily be uh have to be associated with an actual place. So that's my perspective on it. You, see, you mentioned the uh, language part. It kind of, it's an interesting distinction there, right? So in jujitsu, you're not doing a do, you're doing a jitsu. So is it ever a dojo? Do you well, ever train in a dojo for a jujitsu for a jitsu? In, in Japan, yes, <laughs> it would be. You, you wouldn't be practicing martial arts I mean, you could practice it as a club somewhere, you know, or what's with a group of enthusiasts, but you're you're always practicing in a dojo. Um, you know, for example, judo, kendo, you know, uh, all all these things that are kind of even though they have a do, it's it's more sport oriented, right? And you know, so even they have it set up at police stations, at schools, you know, wh wherever you gather and establish a place for training, it's a dojo. So it's it's it, it's not tied to the arts that you're practicing. In other words, okay. well, I um, I kind of look at it as a club is more of a <coughs> social organization. <coughs> there there may there, there's a common sense common level of knowledge for the most part. Um, very much someone for whatever reason is the leader of the club at that moment um so it's more it's more to me a club is more of a social thing people come and go um, everyone's on a somewhat equal basis <clears throat> whereas a dojo there's there's a greater in addition to the fact that there's a physical place where you're practicing even though it may be someone's backyard. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> in, in a dojo, you you have, a, you should have a definite structure. You have someone who's definitely in charge. They're teaching. They're trying to convey a certain level of knowledge. Um, and I think I think that's the difference. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of MMA clubs where people kind of like come and go as as they wish, and there's no, you know, well, let's go to this club today, let's go to that club tomorrow, and there's no real commitment or dedication to any one place. Uh, it's more to the, I would think, to the people that are actually there, which makes it more social rather than... Uh, a dojo, which is a more formalized learning environment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, Sensei, that's a good point. And to that end, like, for example, we have both. We have a, a regular dojo, but then we have clubs <laughs> uh, where people practice, you know, kind of as a social uh, setting, like outside in a park. We have one in Burbank. We have one in Santa Clarita. We have one in, you know, the Valley. And these are just kind of students that, you know, decided to have a social club. So it's, you know, it's still associated with us, but it's more of a hangout, but they do practice, you right. know, also. So. Right. And, and even if you get two people together, I mean, like when I was, before we had Black Belt, uh, there'd be two or maybe three of us that would get together and practice. So that makes it a, you know, does that make it a club because it's a social group? Um, anyway, Robert, you want to get something in edgewise? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think the MMA guys tend to think of things as a gym. 
So no matter where you go, because I always get those guys calling up saying, hey, can I come over to your gym? Um, and, and I think that's how they think of it, which probably in their case is appropriate. Um, because I, I think of where I train as a place of the way. And I think even if you're training in a park, if there's a couple of you getting together to train, it's still a place of the way. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's really about the discipline. And what are you pursuing? If you're pursuing a martial way, no problem. A martial sport, well, then it's a gym, you know, and uh, and I think that distinction is um, appropriate. It might be splitting hairs a little bit, but I think that's that's really what it comes down to. Um, and I, I, I think the place to play means that we're doing something almost semi-sacred in, in, a, in a way of speaking. Yeah, I, because, I, I, think, I, I think once you say club, because it's more social, uh, the members of the club or the participants will do other things as well. Uh, you know, they may get together at other times for other activity, you know, similar activities, but you know, it's, 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 <clears throat> it's just, it is distinct from a dojo, which, which has, you know, as, as, as Chris has said, and I've said, it's, it's a dojo is a far more formalized learning environment and you go into a dojo environment, regardless of physically where it is, and there's you know, there's certain mode of behavior that's expected, respect, uh, attitude, all these other things come into play because you're in a place where you are trying to acquire a skill. Now, obviously, MMA people and BJJ people are trying to do the same thing, but um, <laughs> it's it's a term it's a terminology that conveys a different like, spirit maybe is the best word I think no. Confucius my favorite Confucian saying is you know that the superior man knows what is right the inferior man knows what will sell and I think that's a uh, that that's very telling in our society today it's easier to sell something that's a gym and it's a lot less easy to say well what we have when they call me for example I probably don't do myself very much good with this, but when they call me, I say, well, our student selection process is this. Boom, boom, boom. And so from the very beginning, I'm laying it out for them that this is a two-way street. Right. You can choose to join, but I can choose to say no. Right. Uh, I, I think also in a gym, the, my impression of a gym is there are many different activities you can do in a gym, whereas in a dojo, there's only one. <laughs> yeah, I think Lao Tzu says, cling fast to the way. Well, and Musashi says, the way is in the training. Yeah. And and so that, to me, that, that makes the the dojo a particularly, a, a particularly sacred place. I mean, even the Koreans have a dojang, which means the same thing. The characters are the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, Larry, Clark, Dave, Emily comments or thoughts uh, only thing i'll say is that uh, we integrate uh, fitness uh into uh, our training so we start out with um, warm-ups and stretching and um uh, uh 40 push-ups and uh 40 walking lunges uh, it really gets the blood rolling uh, everybody's out of breath and so um in that that regard we start out for the first 10 minutes or so as a gym and then we quickly turn into a dojo <laughs> yeah I, I guess i would argue you're always a dojo you're just I, conditioning I, them for the training uh yes it, it, absolutely uh, you you're you're spot on robert um and and um it, it's just that that um i've considered fitness such an important ingredient uh and in, in, in the art form that, that i want to include it in our curriculum and and and, and use it the way we did that's all Absolutely, yeah, it should be. I think that's an interesting thing too. The the Brazilian aspect of it too. I don't know that gym really means something different to them, or if they're just trying to distance themselves from the nomenclature of judo. You know, a lot of their their time is spent just being different from judo. So you stop saying that it's judo. 
You know what I mean? They you know, like so they have a kimono, they go to a gym, they they roll, they don't do randori, you know, whatever. They they have different terms for everything, even the techniques. They'll give them like an Americana is a Japanese technique, right? You know, but um I don't know if that distinction is as real as like the distinction a, a non-martial artist would say a gym versus a dojo, right? I think they're just they're coming down to um just kind of semantics for the sake of it to be different. Um, one thing I'll, I'll add, one of the things about, I, I was in clubs. So a lot of times I think a club is something that happens at like a university, right? You'll have like uh, an Aikido club, a karate club, whatever. And when those happen, I think what's, what's really being said is this is not affiliated with the university in any way. It's not credit bearing and it's not anything. It's not in, you know, encouraged really, it's like an extracurricular. So you're on your own. Um, and the, the teacher won't give you rank. Like you can't test for any rank. You're not actually in the dojo, but you're getting all of the instruction and you learn things and everything. And you mostly train by yourself, but like a sensei comes to visit once a week or whatever, but then he has a dojo where if you're those same students, but you belong to the dojo, you get the rank and you get the the whatever, but you're paying a lot of money too. So I think there's also that financial aspect where if you're, you know, doing it for a club, sometimes it's like volunteer or free, but you won't truly be in it, right? You're just kind of learning the techniques of it, not in it. But if you join the dojo, then they, they give you the belts and you move along and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's just my experience. Okay. Uh, so I'd say um, uh, just to chime in. I know you're calling me. I don't want to uh, ignore uh, ignore <laughs> ignore me. Call out. Um, you know, I'm not overcommitted one way or the other. So I'm just appreciating the different perspectives here. Uh, the way I always kind of looked at it, um, and, and again, just a loose interpretation. I was not overcommitted to it either way. Was a dojo was more of a a, a permanent location, if you will, uh, a, 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 more based on a location. Whereas a club is more more transient, or that location is used for a number of different things. Um, you know, my, my college, my university had, had a Shotokan club and we had a <coughs> legitimate sense of actually established rank. And it was some of the best Shotokan training that I had ever received. Really, my foundation really comes from what I learned in, in a Shotokan club at my college. Um, when I look at a dojo, I, I, I kind of just, in the, and maybe it's just the terminology. And I really like, um, I really like, I think it was, uh, Chris that, 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 put the comparison of the language. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. Well done. Um, when I look at a dojo, I'm looking more, it, or it's kind of inferred. I imply more of, of the development as, as, as Dr. Robert Jones put into the superior man. You're looking for development as, as the character as a whole. Whereas, you know, when I think of the term gym, like the MMA uh, stuff is going on the BJJ, that's more of developing, mastering a, a technique rather than than the whole person, if you will. And that's just how I infer the language, but that's just, uh, that's just me. And again, great perspectives. I'm not overcommitted one way or the other. Um, and I'm just taking everyone's comments in. Thank you. Okay. Tom, Thomas, you want to put in two cents? Uh, not much. I don't, I, <laughs> it's just whatever somebody wants to call it as the training uh, they want to call it a club or a, a, a tea party. I don't care. Okay. I, it, 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 we're going to do jujitsu. That's all. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I think, I think to an extent it's a terminology issue. I think to some extent, uh, the word club or, or gym is not as, for lack of a better phrase, intimidating. Uh, which means it isn't expecting a certain, you know, it's more informal. We're getting together. We're going to have a good time. Uh, where, whereas in a dojo, you, you have a much more formal environment. That's not to say that a club can't be formal, but you, it's, it's a different, it creates a different impression or perception, probably a better word. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next one, which is, what do you do when a technique doesn't work on the street? <laughs> on the street. Oh if my God. If it doesn't work on the street, you're in trouble. 
adapt, <laughs> adapt, and, adapt and overcome. Right, right, right. You know, I mean, I'm, you know. You uh, know, most, in my experiences, most techniques don't work on the street the first time around. You have to flow into a next one. And you almost, and what I found myself doing a lot of times is I would, I would use my first technique as a setup because as, as, <laughs> as, you, as you put your hands on more and more people and, and find out how they react, um, uh, you'll find that the majority of people are going to do maybe one or two reactions to your to your move. For example, if you pull someone's elbow or someone's arm, they're going to tend to pull it back. Well, that sets up a completely different technique. So if you pull someone's arm to go into an arm bar and they pull back, you no longer have the momentum for an arm bar. You need to flow into something else. So learning by by practice and techniques and seeing what people do under, uh, naturally under 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 that circumstance opens up your different techniques so it's almost that like you have to flow into that next next technique if you will and and i would use that you know quite often as 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 really as a setup i would pull someone's arm or knowing that they're going to go one way and would lead to my next technique and and really what what leads to that is is my location or my environment i don't want my back to the street i don't want my back to an angry crowd uh and and i would take that in consideration on on the setup technique that I would use to lead into my next flowing technique. So I can find myself in a superior position. Um, you, you have to be able to flow off of things. You really do. Yeah. And to Parker, Ed Parker always used to say there's three phases to a technique. There's the ideal phase. He called it the what if phase, which I don't like. I always call that the variable expansion phase myself. I just like scientific sounding stuff. And then he uh, and then he said the final phase was the formulation phase. And essentially, that's what you do. You're always going to operate in an ideal phase. But ideally, what I think the thing I like most about every art I've studied is it's always been about the body. So you got to do the body work. You got to take the impacts. You've got to be able to, you know, kind of figure out how people react of all different all different types and things. And um, and then once you've done that, you know, it becomes a lot easier to adapt in the street because at some point or another, based on your experience, you probably run into that response. Um, and so I, I think he's right. There's this ideal phase that we practice all the time. But then when you do body work, you find that there's always that moment where somebody comes along with something you haven't seen before or they're, they're not. Everybody's a little different. And and that. And that forces you into the variable expansion phase. Okay, he did something totally off the wall. Absolutely. And then you say, all right, how do I formulate my way around that? And absolutely. And you know what else it does is is by training in in a flowing kind of practice, you 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 reduce that that hesitation gap, if you will. Uh, instead of like, oh, this didn't work. What do I do now? And that gap, a lot of times, will 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 be a game changer. So you really have to close that hesitation gap. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think I, I agree with Larry too. The specific thing that I had told my students, and from my own experience, you never do the same technique twice. If it doesn't work the first time, you've got to do something different. You never try. Oh, it didn't work that time. Let me reset and do it again. No, do something different. As as I jokingly tell my students, you know, and when they get into uh, street attack situations, which we do practice, pass it. If, if it doesn't work the first time, you can't tell your attacker, excuse me, can we try this attack again so I can do this technique yeah. quickly? It, 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 I'm there. Well, you can try that. that. Would, would, would that know? work? <laughs> it isn't going to happen. Um, you have to be able to, as Larry said, you have to be able to adapt. And uh, the more experience you have, the better you, well, I'm not saying go out and fight street fights, but the more experience you have with those type of situations, whether it be you know, hopefully in the dojo, the better you get at reducing that hesitation gap. Uh, another thing I tell my students is Seki's attitude was never fight your attacker, always help them. And that means that you have, your, you, your body has to be relaxed enough so that you can sense where the other person, for lack of a better phrase, where the other person wants to go. Even though they may be resisting your technique, they want to go in a certain direction. And so you help them in that direction. Or you or you re-guide re them into the direction you want to go. 
but you have to use their their energy or their key or whatever you want to call it to get what you want. Um, and uh, so, I, I, you know, that's it's the street situations happen just incredibly fast. Uh, I've had students in street situations. In every case, it's been over in five or six seconds. They have no idea what they did, uh, <laughs> which is the way it's supposed to be. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, I, I know one of the things, because Larry and I have been working on something on the side and reading through one of the manuals Larry gave me was one of, one of the key elements was uh, called the ABCs, B is breathe. And uh, I think we mentioned in our last session when we were talking about uh, uh, handguns and rifles that uh, you, you don't fire a weapon while you're inhaling, you exhale. And the purpose of exhaling is it relaxes your body. <clears throat> last, what well, I tried a couple of weeks ago with my students, I say, try inhaling and executing a technique at the same time. It won't happen. Okay. Your body simply can't do it. So that's a that's another key, perhaps, is, is keeping your body relaxed. And to do that, you have to be breathing. You can't be holding your breath and trying to defend yourself at the same time. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt this, but I'm uh, as I know as you know, I've got to uh, I've got to run, but. I wanted to um, introduce uh, my guest for the weekend is uh, Ron Carlson. He's from Colorado, and uh, he's uh, he just wanted to say hi because he's been to one of your camps, I think, once. Yes, twenty years ago. George. Many, many years ago. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if you remember or not, but <laughs> name I remember. <laughs> and, and anyone can tell you, I I'm rough on remembering names. <laughs> okay. Unless, well, I, he, unless I talk with the person a lot. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I do have to run, but I, I, I really enjoyed the chat. So um, we'll see you all. And I'm all seminaring away this morning. So <laughs> thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. So do we want to do, deal with anything else so far? What do you do when a technique doesn't work? Or Sensei, I'll just jump in here for a moment and say, keep moving. You definitely don't want to be a sitting target. You don't want to stop. You don't want the deer in the headlights. Keep moving. And your body, um, with uh, the training, uh, will uh, often go into another technique, uh, whether you think about it or not. Uh, I would also recommend that if you're not already doing it, practice chaining techniques together. One of my favorite things to do um, uh, I, I, I love the Yawara and I love multiple technique flow. Those are my two favorite things to do. Uh, uh, personally, uh, training in jiu-jitsu, I love to chain, you know, uh, 10, 12, 15 techniques together. Uh, your summer camp uh, back in uh, 2016, uh, uh, I, I did a 90-minute a, 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 a session and we uh, I, I demonstrated chaining 60 uh, techniques back to back, um, and um, it's just a, it's great because you get an idea of what you can do from a variety of positions. So um, I, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a superior way to to practice the art form, and uh, um, it makes it more likely that as you keep moving, that you just will naturally go into something else that you've already trained your body to do. Yeah, an another variation on that that I find I end up doing usually with lower rank students, maybe sixth, maybe fifth Q by fourth Q, they've got it figured out. They'll get into a technique and they'll do it backwards. They could go in the other direction and they think they're doing something wrong. And I say, yeah. keep moving, keep going in that direction. And lo and behold, if they continue in that direction, one of the nice things about jujitsu is that eventually you will run into a technique. And, you know, they, you know, uh, hand throw, wrist lock, takedown. It's the exact same technique, but it's done opposite. 
it's an opposite movement. Uh, corkscrew and shoulder locker takedown are the same technique, except you're going in opposite direction. And there are a whole series of techniques. Some, someday I might get all this stuff down. But it part of it is you let students know not to stop, but to keep, as you said, keep moving. You'll eventually run into something, hopefully in a timely manner, <laughs> hopefully very quickly. Yes. Um, if nothing else happens, at least Tai Sabaki, hello, it's always there. Yeah. You know, I, I can't agree more. And that just kind of goes to, to what, what my term was. I was deeming as flow, right? Um, if, if if your garages are anything like my garage, it's completely cluttered. Every time I clean it, I turn around and it's cluttered again, right? So what I find myself doing, how I train is, is these days, you know, I'm training by myself. I'll go to my garage and I'll just move in a circular motion. And when I crash into something, you know, you know, flow off of that. Just keep moving. I can't go this way. Now I got to go a different way. And, and, and I just kind of will just keep moving through that garage. And as I crash into something and I'm, I'm, I'm checking my footwork, I'm checking my balance. Um, am I in a good position to be able to move off of that? And, uh, and, and the more I do that, uh, that's really how I develop that and practice that just the basics, really just, I just keep flowing off of whatever unexpected item I was going to be there. You know, if I'm in a bar and I crash into a table or a, a beer bottle that's on the floor or a car in a parking lot, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. You can't, you can't force your way through that obstacle. You need to, you know, you need to maneuver around that. Um, and that's how I, how I train these days, really. Now, one of, one of the things, uh, a couple weekends ago, I was in a seminar at a, a, another dojo and, uh, they wanted me to teach, uh, what do you do when you're pinned up against the wall? And my attitude has always been the wall is your friend, and so is a corner. Uh, and I said, when you get pinned against the wall, I want your partner to really pin you against the wall. And the, the, the problem they were running into is they were trying to push off from the wall. I said, you can't do that. But nothing prevents you from sidestepping. And they found that if they simply sidestep, the person was exerting a lot of pressure, that person's head usually hit the wall. Um, so, you know, it's, it's as, as you're saying, Larry, you have to use your environment as well as, as part of your weapons resource or part of your uh, re resource. Uh, but that's an entirely, you know, use, using things in your environment is an entirely different topic, but I think I think we, the, the key is to keep going uh, because the alternative isn't good. <laughs> there. Okay. I think too, a part of it is uh, not thinking of techniques, right? Like at a certain point, you want to stop, you want to stop thinking about individual techniques because like you said, there aren't any, right? Like everything that's a jujitsu technique is just a name for a way the body turns on yes. its own right like you're not doing anything the body just does those things and you're facilitating it right. and in the beginning you have to be very focused on technique like this wrist lock happens like this and you're looking at your thumbs and you're looking at your hand and you're doing a technique but eventually you like you aren't thinking i'm going to put this guy in a wrist lock you're thinking this guy's going to lay down on the floor next to me and then the right. wrist lock is what you did to do that, right? right? And I think at that point, you're not flowing from technique to technique to technique. You're doing one thing, putting this guy on the floor. And then it just happens, right? I think it's the beginner attitude of like, I'm going to put this guy on the floor. What are the five or six things I know that do that? How do I do it? Do I grab him? Oh, no, I'm supposed to grab left hand. I grabbed right hand. Now what, right? Once you've done all that, you're in the principle phase where you're like this guy's leaning slightly right he's going down over there and i don't know how but he's gonna you know and then he shifts his body you're not thinking that anymore now you're just thinking he's going over here now and you know i think that's the trick is think about the think about what you want your opponent to do not what you have to do to do it right, right? yeah the i mean this this last class one of my newer students is trying to do wrist lock takedown and for some reason that person's elbow was up in the air, pointing at it. And I said, 
what are you looking at? What's in front of your face? And the girl said, well, it, it's his elbow. I said, well, you know what to do with an elbow, don't you? She says, yeah, but I'm supposed to be doing a wrist lock takedown. I said, what's the easiest target right now? She says, the elbow. I said, okay, use it. And she, so she did an elbow roll, took him down, you know, with the wrist lock, and she was happy. You know, uh, uh, getting students to be aware of what's going on around them, which was the A for Larry, uh, <laughs> awareness, you know, if, if you're aware of what's going on around you and what the other person is doing, you are much better able to counter that or use that, as I should say, be a better way of stating that. Okay. Dane has been waiting all morning for this. <laughs> we're, we're not going to get into the difference between Ike and Kiai. Uh, <clears throat> And I don't know if you have this in front of you or not. Uh, he had the, uh, they are the same kanji reversed in karate. You expend energy to respond to an attack by influencing your opponent using an expulsion of your specific spirit key, ki, ki, while in aiki, judo, do, you absorb and or redirect your opponent's expel expulsion of spirit that was directed towards you so it works against it. In Kiai, you provide the energy source. In Aiki, your opponent does. Uh, Aikido is soft, karate is hard. Do you Kiai in Aikido? Uh, the, and then the silent Kiai. So, uh, you want to start this topic off, Dave? Yeah. So, I don't have any. Uh real agenda with it other than i think it's just kind of interesting to talk about and kind of look at and how it relates to things and i think really um I, it was news to me that was something i learned recently that kiai and aiki are the same backwards you know for years and years of doing both of them i had no idea of that so that was something that kind of changed how i think about everything um and how things work and aikido in particular um they do things in a very stylistic manner <clears throat> where to use it in the real world, you have to add some stuff that they don't show you, right? Like you're like, they might not show you the Atemi, but it's there. You know, if you watch old, old footage, the Aikido guys are always slapping you in the face and punching you in the stomach when they're doing things. And then that just slowly went away so that you're doing cooperative uh, techniques. But I think there were times back then where you would ki. Like you might grab your opponent, yell at him and scare him and, and do that and then um, put him down. But then over time, Aikido focused on just the other part of using your opponent's energy and pulling energy in and redirecting it. Whereas karate kind of does the opposite. You know, they focus on things like you were talking about the example of the uh, opponent coming towards you and thinking about like what he needs to do and where putting him where he wants to go and all of that. And, you know, absorbing his um, energy and then just kind of re redistributing it out. And that's kind of the, the principle of Aiki. But a, a karate practitioner might approach it like a brick wall and just stand right in front of them and block it and, you know, have that kind of a confrontation and try to overwhelm it with force, like try to overwhelm force with even more force or a different force. So it's kind of like redirecting force or force against force. And then I think they're both inside of each other too. Like I think in karate, there are times that you are doing Aiki, you know, in, in, in Aikido, there are times that you are doing kiai you know, so to speak. Um, so that's just kind of where that's coming from. Um, and I think the, the silent kiai too, that's kind of the concept of breathing. Like you were saying, you have to do a technique on an exhale and ki is nothing but a purposeful exhale, you know, really. So, you know, part of ki is to make sure you're breathing. It's to make sure you're putting your air out when you're attacking and things. And if you get hit, sometimes you ki um, because you don't want to get hit when you're breathing in, right? You want to get hit when you're breathing out too. So it's as much about um, breath control and energy and things too, as much as it is about screaming, you know, the, the, the yelling factor is very um, 
you know, focused on, but I, I think it's also more about the expulsion of air and, you know, what that does to you um, physically while you're doing it. So that's just kind of where, where that's coming from. Okay. Any, anyone else want to add some input here? Dane, you mentioned uh, how these guys are just reversed and we have a keto. Uh, it's interesting because the first thing my brain did is go, okay, so where's the keido? Um, and perhaps that's just another, you know, uh, term for uh, the, the linear arts, the hard arts, the karate. Uh, but right. no one calls it keido. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> no one, and really they didn't used to call Aikido. I mean, there was a daido route, but largely it was just kind of a way, like it was inside of all jujitsu. There would be, even inside of uh, daido Ru, they have a curriculum that they consider jujitsu and then a curriculum that they consider aiki jujitsu. And they, they have like different parts of it, right. even within themselves and other jujitsu right. have aiki moments, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, having it be aiki do in and of itself is very like spiritual and you know uh way shibo is as into religion as he was martial arts mm -hmm. so you know it's there's a lot of his um religious beliefs in there and i think that's why he wanted to make it the way of harmonizing your key you know and i think that has a better appeal than having something be like the way of clashing your key right i guess it's just not catchy but yeah i think i think for in shorthand, I think karate is Kiaido, right? And there are some some weird fringe martial arts that do focus just on yelling at people. They think that if somebody's running at them, they can just, bah! and then the person falls down and collapses because their key's been influenced. I, I, don't, I don't follow that or study that, so I don't know much about it, but <laughs> I've seen people do that, be Kiai masters and, and, and do that. So in, in some extent, there is a Kiaido somewhere. Yeah, I, <laughs> for take it for what it's worth. I I think I I know in jujitsu we use a ki in the process of executing a technique, which is the same as we're actually exhaling it, exhaling. And uh, as as Saki used to explain it, the the ki is to emphasize or to take the other person's key and use their key to combine it with your energy as necessary to execute a technique okay and that's why the, that's the value of the key i theoretically combines your key with your attacker's key in essence what it really is happening he's going in a particular direction if you go to the physics of it he's going in a particular direction and all you're doing is helping him go in that direction so you can do whatever technique would work if he goes in that direction okay uh and as, as we said someone says previously you know all i think all martial arts is, is a response to what the attacker does unless you are the aggressor um the the other value of the key i uh, and, and i've had students even in the regular classroom, if we're bent out of shape or something like that, I just simply say, just sit down. Yeah, here's a chair. Sit down, take a deep breath, exhale, and relax. And then we'll talk about it. And it, it's amazing how that expulsion of air, breathing, can calm a person down. Um, and you don't say it in a threatening manner or anything like that. It's just, you know, you have to convey the idea that you're there to, quote, unquote, help them. Uh, but they need to be part of that solution. Uh, and and that, that works, you know, I even do it myself. If I'm stressed out, I'll just take, you know, I'll just go into another room or I'll sit down or I'll look outside and just inhale and exhale and sometimes the light gets turned on and i'm able to resolve the problem okay uh or at my, my age sometimes i exhale and i forgot what the problem was uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the advantages of getting older 
Uh, <laughs> the benefit. <laughs> but it, it comes back and bites you later. Anyway. <laughs> But, no, but in all seriousness, you know, the breathing, the breathe, breathing, breathing is so important. That's obvious. Um, but it, it's how you breathe that determines how successful you will be. I think in almost anything you do, whether it be martial arts or surgery or as a police officer or uh, as a piano teacher, sometimes you have a person who doesn't know a white key from a black key on the piano keyboard. And all you can do is just inhale and exhale and say, we must go on. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a universal uh, means of relaxation or, or refocusing maybe is a better word. Um, but I think I, 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 yeah, I don't know how you can do Aikido without a key eye. I mean, it can be a silent key eye, but you're still exhaling as you execute the technique. So whether you're, you're being very, you know, a loud scream, loud death call, or you're just exhaling, it's, you, you can do it with the same emphasis. It doesn't matter. Maybe you want to grow up and be a ninja. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And Who doesn't? So, any, anything else you want to do with it with this one? Uh, I can jump in, Sensei. Sure. I think we've talked about certain aspects of this, you know, in the past, and um, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of misconception because, um, you know, in the in the old days, as I as the more I learn and um, the more I understand it. <laughs> Sometimes we get hung up on labels. We've labeled everything now, you know, jujitsu, karate, aikido, you know, whatever. And and what we're seeing is kind of the the shadow version of of these things, for the most part, uh, you know, not not in its entirety, because when you go back far enough, every martial arts, the aiki concept or kiai concept. Oh, it's the same thing. It's kind of like a yin and yang. It must, it exists in all, mar at least Japanese martial arts <laughs> and, and their derivative. It exists in every single one of those. And if you go back far enough, they all included empty hand techniques, weapons, striking, grappling, horseback riding, depending on how far back you go. I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense to have an incomplete, you know, martial art if you're trying to survive, if you're trying to win a war, you know, but as times change and, you know, where, whether you have peaceful times or now the situation's more on the street rather than the battlefield or, or competition or sport, as times change, the focus on how you apply those things you know, also changes. And in the process, these this concept of Aiki and Kiai, you know, also in, in some places it carries on, but maybe one aspect of it or the other, or it disappears altogether. And it just becomes, you know, purely, you know, about technique, you know, completely missing, you know, the, the concept portion. So, um <laughs> You know, whether we talk about, you know, like in Aikido, for example, I studied that for years, you know, and uh, and, and Hapkido, you know, also, if you go back pre-World -war, War II, you, you, you can, you know, Yoshiba was very good in documenting things. You know, he used to say that Aikido is over 90% Atemi, strikes, okay, <laughs> and only 10%, you know, grappling. That's not how we think of it now. You know, in some places you'll see zero strikes. But after World War II, because, he, you know, he changed, right? I mean, an undefeated nation in like history got defeated very badly. <laughs> so so it's it's a, it's an ego check. You know, it's a, it causes you to examine, you know, your life, your philosophy, your purpose. So he started focusing much more on, on spiritual things, 
you know, rather than the martial arts aspect. So he used the martial arts and and the techniques he practiced were for a different end, okay, R- rather than what, what it was done before. So the students that studied with him after World War II are very different than the students that practiced with him before World War II. Pre-World War II is very much like the jiu-jitsu we know today. Post-World War II, there's no strikes. There's, you know, it's all blending, very soft, because the intention is give your opponent another way out. You don't need to hurt them necessarily. Just provide them another way out, and hopefully they'll take it. No harm, no foul, we'll move on. Spiritually, that sat better than the mentality that Japan had for a thousand years is to dominate and destroy, you know, your your enemy. So, so I'll throw out this this kind of a little challenge, okay? Because I can I can probably write a whole book about this topic. Is you know try for the next three months, you know, or whatever amount of time. Don't use the word jujitsu or whatever you practice. And whenever you talk to people or they ask you, what do you do? Or what do you, even if your students ask you, what are you trying to do? You know, don't use the word jujitsu at all. Find another way to explain what you're doing, you know, and that might be, you know, something like, well, I'm trying not to get hurt. So I'm using strategy to do this. I'm using technique to do this so, so that I can, I can accomplish this. And if you just, Talk about it that way and just remove that label. That's what you're practicing, <laughs> regardless of what someone, you know, labels it. So, for example, we offer tons of karate classes. You come to my class, it'll look like your jiu-jitsu, okay? It won't look like Shotokan, you know, for example. Parts of it will if we're doing forms and things like that. But in application, it's it's far beyond kicking and punching. Kicking and punching are the setups, Okay, for for everything else, you know, you go to, uh, you know, somebody comes to your jujitsu dojos, they're probably thinking Brazilian jujitsu, because that's what people see today. And all of a sudden, they see oh, a lot of stuff is happening standing up. What is this? You say it's jujitsu. So if you remove that label and just just focus on what you're doing for what purpose, and, and just talk about the techniques and the concepts, Aiki and Kiai are already there. Okay, because, um, you know, I heard one part of it. The other part of that is your opponent because it was strategy. So if your opponent is still taking a deep breath to exhale to do something to you, you hit him (laughs) during the inhale process. That's your that's your eye key or or kia. Okay, because you're trying to knock that wind out of him before he's fully charged, you know, to exhale. If he's fully charged and exhaling, which means he's delivering force towards you, now you practice Aiki because you don't want to you don't want to be the recipient of that. So you yield one way or the other, right? The soft part of it, so, so that he can fully exhale. So then you can do, you know, now uh, uh, you know, discharge your energy. So it's uh it's the whole thing was modeled after a heartbeat. <laughs> Right. It's it's always it's always doing this. And what you do when it's closed or what what you do when it's open is that that very concept of Aiki. So so sometimes or oftentimes we only think of it from our perspective. We have to think from their perspective, too. You know, if the person's arm is doing this, that's the time to attack. But if it's already coming towards you, that's the time you know, to Aiki, basically, but it's interchangeable. You can't have one without the other. That's why the kanji is reversible, because it always exists in everything. And if you think about it, that's life. You know, it exists in life, too. And as with all Japanese things, uh, at least the old stuff, it mimics nature. It mimics life. It's embedded in their culture. And that's the part we lose, you know, by... You know, I think largely because of advertising, honestly, in this country, <laughs> because we put labels on it because because you have to, like how what do you advertise? You know, what are you teaching? Martial arts, too vague. OK, and then then you get into, OK, as soon as you say jujitsu, people think ground grappling. You say, 
you know, kickboxing, you know, just kicking and punching. You say karate, God knows what they think. You know, you say Taekwondo, maybe they think sport. And all of it can be true or none of it can be true. That's the problem, you know. So try not using a label, you know, for, for the next few months and try to explain to people what you do. And that's what you do. So it's funny, too. I think you touched on some of uh, the other topics that are listed there, too, about how uh, karate and jujitsu are the same thing mixed together. You know, they're inside of each other and stuff, too. And uh, you just jarred loose um, the goju-ru. Goju-ru karate, the name of it means hard, hard soft. soft. The, yeah. the ju is the same as jujitsu. And they got that from the Bubishi, where there's a famous quote in it or something that's like, the way of breathing is hard and soft. And like you were saying, like everything ultimately comes down to the heartbeat and breathing um, in nature. That's all there is. You're either breathing in or breathing out, right? You're, that's all there is in life. And you're studying both of those things, you know? And the real karate has both. Like Goju-Ru is telling you that it is a system composed of hard and soft. They are both in there, but you don't ever see it. It's That's like the hidden teachings, is knowing how to pull that out. And you just see the external stuff, the stuff that looks like karate, you know? Weichiru, also, the original name of Weichiru uh, was Pangainun, which also means hard, soft. So it's definitely baked into karate that the idea is that stuff is hard and soft, and in my interpretation of a lot of the kata, to me, we're very, so originally, not to get really off track, but I think it relates here. So like, if you don't know karate really deeply well, you should have no idea what a kata is. When you watch somebody do a karate kata and you're not a master of that kata, it looks like people punching and kicking. So... It can't be because that's what it looks like it is. And the kata is disguising things, right? So if you have a kata that anyone can look at and say, that's where you're kicking the guy in the knee, you're obviously not kicking him in the knee, right? So like there's moments where it looks like you're stomping a knee. I think you're doing a tayatoshi. I think you're dropping your foot in front of your opponent and then throwing him over you. The next technique is you're holding his head down and punching him. Right. So a karate person looks at that like you just kicked him in the knee. He fell down. You walk over to him. You pick him up and hit him. But a jujitsu person looks at that and says, um, I'm holding him here. I did a knee kick, but that looks like I'm just putting my foot in front of his legs and twisting my hips. Now he's on the floor and now I'm punching him. You know, but if you only look at it through one filter, that's what you know, when you uh, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And the way you teach karate is you give them a toolbox with thousands of different tools in it. And then every class you have them pound nails into the wall. And then eventually they just look at their kata like all these things are hammers. And they're not yeah, thinking depends. when they go home, let me try this. What happens if I twist it? What happens if that, I pry? Well, you know? That depends on the teacher, you know, how they're yeah. teaching. And, and both those scenarios can be true because... Remember, a kata is just a series of techniques stitched together to deal with different scenarios. So you could use it as a kick and punch, or you could use it as a grappling technique. It just that's the I key and ki I concept. It just depends yes. on the situation. So the bunkai, the interpretation, you know, of it is really the key. Because if if you were to take a simple jujitsu, you know, technique and do it by yourself. That's your kata. Somebody looking at it, not knowing what it is, they can think you're kicking and punching too. But in your mind, you're grappling, you know, right? So mm -hmm. it's a, not not to, uh, since I take up too much time here, but there's an interesting uh, old article uh, about uh, how boxing destroyed karate. <laughs> um, in, in this was during the Meiji Restoration was where J Japan was trying to, you know, um, kind of exerted superiority. So they were fascinated by Western things and they were they would invite Western boxers and and grapplers and stuff to kind of show their stuff and there were public exhibits. Uh, by this time, Genshin Funakoshi was already in, in Japan uh, running his karate organization through the universities. And he had already taken out 
uh, he had already taken out the grappling portion of karate, which is how the world got to know it, you know, afterwards, sadly. But uh, th there's a <laughs> very famous fighter, Motobu Choki, and, uh, and, and he practiced Okinawa karate, and he traveled to Japan because he was looking for a job, you know, hard times. Anyway, so so he reads in the newspaper this boxer, right? It's like a movie challenging people to come up, you know, and take them. And so he goes to the ex uh, 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 to the exhibition. By this time, apparently, he's over fifty years old. Okay, and so he he gets up on stage. Uh, boxer comes at him. He does tai sabaki. <laughs> then punches him and then takes him down, you know, and, and wins the bout, you know? And, um, and when they asked him what, what he did, you know, he said, well, it's karate. And then they, they said, uh, uh, you know, they said, oh, there's a guy that's teaching, you know, uh, karate. So he goes and meets Funakoshi. Funakoshi fights him three times, loses every time exactly the same way. This is all documented. Because Funakoshi had stopped doing grappling. And 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 so Motobu, you know, used grappling and kicking and punching, you know, to, to defeat him. Um anyway, so so karate moved forward as defeating boxing as a superior way to kick and punch versus Western boxing. And that's how Japan chose to popularize karate. That's that's how we know it. But in the old days, it was just like any other martial art. It had everything, you know. Um, but, you know, again, coming back to labels, you know, for a society that especially recent in recent times, you know, we're against labeling things. <laughs> in martial art, it still persists. And, and it works, I think, against, you know, most people rather than do good. But it comes down to the teacher. It's not the art. It's not the system. To me, you got to always seek out a good teacher, you know, rather than w what it's called. It's like we were talking about before. Once you call it a technique, you've ruined it. And now yeah. you're focused on something, right? And like, uh, I love that Mo Motobu is a big part of my uh, my karate fascination, too. And he was one of my sensei's senseis uh, at some point. So he's a little in my lineage, too. So, um, but when he took Funakoshi, he specifically used Kodagaishi on him each time which is right. like the most which is hard to do <laughs> and it's yeah. not a karate technique right like unless you've stepped out of karate in recent years unless you've stepped this, out this is right. this is kotegashi exactly it's yeah. in the kata it has yeah. to be in the kata right this is not an augmented block it, right. if somebody's not punching you so hard that this is going to you don't need two hands that's right <laughs> right and you're not chambering something at your hips like this you've got them in an arm bar yeah right um but you know, so like if if karate is punching and kicking, then how did Motobu put him in a wrist lock, right? So obviously right. it's in the kata, and we know what kata Motobu knew, you know, and and that's the biggest thing: naming the techniques from the. So historically, like pre nineteen hundred, you're talking you learned kata, that's it, you learned the entire thing, and then you had to figure out what the entire thing is all about. Then they started taking individual moments of it. So there might be a moment in the kata where you put your arm out to your side, but it's immediately followed with other things. But now this is a movement and you name it and you practice it for an hour, going up and down, practicing it. Somebody throws a punch, you practice blocking it. You, you've taken it all out of context and given each one of them a name. Like this movement now is a block. This one's a block. And they don't go together with anything. Now they're individual little sections. But really what you're doing is taking a kata and you're saying, take the very first movement of the kata and now just practice that for months going back and forth on the floor. It's not in and of itself its own thing. But we teach people that. And now we teach them that first. You teach them all the punches and kicks going back and forth first. Then you show them a kata. And their mind thinks, oh, okay, so a kata is a dance routine, so I can remember all these individual techniques, and it's just taking these individual techniques, stringing them together in a pattern. But each of them are their own technique. And that's where I give you that hammer analogy. By doing that, you're teaching them 
that each one of those moments is its own thing that does one thing where really it's just a second of a kata and you can't look at it out of context. Like, like you're not going to learn a song on the piano by sitting there pressing a for like two hours, right? A might be the first note of the piece you're playing, right? But it's not the piece. It's out of context. Like what's the next note? Why, you know, what key am I in? And all that kind of stuff. And it's the same deal. Um, way off track there but yeah i i love the um that interconnectivity of it all and that it all is there it's all one thing there isn't like we were saying there's no techniques right you're just naming the way the human body moves like every martial art you're doing things to move the human body in the ways it moves right you can't you can't really make anything up <laughs> right? I, I think okay I'm, I'm gonna go back to what uh, chris said at one point he said uh it's all or nothing. And uh, both of those not only symbolize I key and key I, but the concept of all or nothing goes back to when I was teaching uh, what to do when you're pushed up against the wall. Uh, if you fight back, you're giving your all for very futile purpose. If you simply sidestep, you're letting your attacker commit the all, and you're not really using any energy against it. You just sidestep. It's like if someone swings at you and you simply and move your body out of the way and they go past you and go splat. Um, it's it's like, you know, my aunt who said, if you're not learning, you're dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Seki even said, you know, if, if, if the person has committed their ki their key intentionally and with commitment and you can use their key you have to use very little or none of your own key to defend yourself it can be simply stepping out of the way it can simply hooking onto their wrist and doing a circuit movement and and you're expect you're expecting really no energy you know you're helping them using their key um and so I think the, the value of you know, the comment all or nothing really says it because it, not only are they both opposites, but they're both essential to each other. Okay. If you're not living, yeah. you're dead. Okay. If you don't breathe, you're dead. If, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, there are common, uh, how do you say, there's, there's a common connection between the two. And we can get really philosophical here too. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, it's a just to just to hear myself talk a little more. Um, the one one thing I really like philosophically is the idea of um, as above, so below. I don't know if you've ever heard that. So it's kind of the idea, or like a, a microcosm and a macrocosm kind of an idea, where studying one thing is actually teaching you about other things, right? So. You know, while we're very deeply focused on martial arts and what it all means in Aikido and karate and, and breathing and ki and all of that stuff, we're talking about absolutely everything in the universe, not just jujitsu, right? Yeah. So, like the idea of ki ai and aiki, um, you may never get in a bar fight in your life. So, what good is it, you know, right? But in a discussion at work, in a conference call, in a meeting or something, there's a time for aiki of letting your, we'll call it an opponent, but letting your uh, other person you're debating, letting them pull, you know, put out their ideas. And then you have a choice of, do you fight it with your ideas or do you take their ideas and pick them apart and find the weaknesses in what they're saying, right? It's e like, you can point out that somebody's wrong or you can try to be right. There's different, argument tactics right sometimes somebody you let somebody talk just so that they talk and talk and talk and kind of prove themselves wrong you can be like but you just said these three things and those don't go together you aren't actually doing anything they're defeating themselves right. you know and that's very I've, high key i've I've, yeah. I've run into that many times and, and i've learned many times if you let if you let if you know where a person is coming from and you have a good idea of where they are going. It's the same as Kia, you know, the key. 
you can let them, there's a common phrase, you can let them dig their own hole. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you don't right. give them a shovel. Uh, and, and, yeah. and so, I mean, even I will fall into that hole at times where I'll start pursuing something and I realize, you know, Kirby, that's really stupid. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, ultimately, and, there's no opponent but yourself, right? No, I mean, <laughs> you're the one you got to defeat. You know, as how do you say, how do you say, someone once told me, it's okay to lose arguments against yourself occasionally. It happens to all of us. You know, we, we lose arguments with ourselves. He said, however, if you do it consist consistently, you need professional help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you need someone else's key yes. to help you get your key back in order. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So let's let's move on here. Um, this is a fun topic: dirty techniques. Um, when I learned from my father, there was a lot of pain compliance and other subtle additions to techniques in addition to the gross limb movements and primary targets for the eyes, throat, and groin, every throw joint lock, including a tamey and additional pain elements, uh, pressing thumbnails or hold it while holding Kote Gaish, pressing pressure points once the opponent is in a hold, etc. cetera. Uh, Pressing any nail will work, but use only one. Philosophical question, what makes a technique dirty? Um, I don't think there are any dirty techniques. I think there are systems that say, and I have, I've been told from Sensei that that's not appropriate to do. We don't do that in our system. Um, and... I, I think what you know that's okay. They want to not do certain things. There are th things we don't do in Budo Shin Jiu Jitsu, you know, hunky dory. Um, uh, there are differences, but I think to say that techniques are dirty, if if you've ever seen males fight versus versus females fighting, <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different. Guys have rules. <laughs> there are things you do not do. Girls. Everything is fair game. And uh, uh, the, the same in the street, uh, Hal Brocious, he would, he would teach how to bite properly, how to tear lips properly, and cheeks. You know, and it's so simple to do. Um, and, and, and most systems, I mean, I even very rarely teach it. Um, because it's, I say, gross totally gross to most people but if if you're in a life or death situation and you have to defend yourself i also tell my students there are no rules you know better to i say better to be tried by 12 people than carried by six yeah uh, <laughs> yeah. uh so i don't know uh and I don't consider any of these things from adding pain technique or nerve technique to a hold or something. I, that's all clean for Seki. That's, you know, cool. You know, you're able to combine techniques. Um, yeah. And that's perfectly all right. That's, that's totally clean. The, the dirty stuff was, uh, uh, you know, ripping lips, biting ears, sticking a finger up a person's nose and executing a throw that way, uh, which we, unfortunately, you know, we couldn't practice. Uh, but, <laughs> Not twice. <laughs> but, um, uh, I say a, a, a testicle grab prior to intercourse, if it's a rape situation. I mean, these, there's things you simply cannot practice. Um, but, you know, they're all... An, you know, ripping fingers apart. Um, they're they're all legitimate self defense techniques when push really comes to shove, and that's a that's where I differentiate. Where what you're doing looks 
vicious and creates almost immediate visual psychological harm to other people. They're revolted by it. That to me is what is considered dirty or most people consider dirty. But if you're talking about self-defense, nothing is dirty. Okay, so now I'll, I'll shut up and everybody else can put in their three cents. And Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think of them as dirty myself. I think of them as um, just kind of always there, whether you're talking about it or not. It's It's the... I don't know. You don't mention that there's ketchup on your burger. Like you just kind of assume it, right? <laughs> like I had a cheese. Right. You, just, you just know there was ketchup on it, right? And like you have to poke someone in the eye to get Kodagaishi to work sometimes or whatever, you know, like those things just go with it. There's a, I've got an old book that warns about it. They're like, you know, just because you're studying this martial art, don't let that replace everything. This is on top of things. Like we're, you're practicing something that you don't know. Don't forget everything you do know. Like, you know how to yell in somebody's face and, and belittle them and say something to talk them out of it. And if you need to scream in their ear, you know, if somebody is attacking you, you can bite their throat. You can scream in their ear, plug their nose, poke them in the eye. Don't forget all of that because you have these more elaborate techniques. And I've never seen that written before. Yeah. You know, they don't talk about it. And this guy was like, well, don't forget about all that. He, he tells you to spit in their face, too. He's like, spit in their oh. face. Like, don't forget, you can do that, you know. And other books are much more, we get this, um, if you've ever seen old footage of, like, Jujutsuka back in, like, the early 1900s, they're going hard. They have, like, barely any mats, and they are throwing each other, and they are choking each other. But when you look at a Jujutsu book, it's very dignified and sometimes they're wearing like three piece Western suits and everything looks like a handshake that went bad. Right. It's very and, sanitized. Yeah. And you're getting this like image of it as being, and I think it was sold this way as like a gentlemanly way to um, settle a dispute with a ruffian or something like, no. um, <laughs> and I think it, it sort of started to get, that image to it and then from the public mind you start forgetting the stuff like spit in their face and everything because that's not gentlemanly and this is a gentlemanly art and i should be wearing a top hat while i do a hip throw you know and i, I think that kind of takes, took some takes stuff back, away from it takes me back to the james bond movie with the yeah, guy, yeah. guy with the hat me <laughs> odd job yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um but all that stuff was um you know, to me, very important. And, and the Atemi, and like we talked about before, Aikido had it. And now it's just implied. Like, you don't do it, but yeah. you know it's there. Like, if you've studied enough and you're an older practitioner, like, to you, it's there. But I guess to a student's mother, this is a way that, you know, your child can learn to defend themselves without getting messy or something. Right. You know, you I, want I, to I, that. I, I think one thing we're overlooking in, in uh, I don't know how it plays out in other martial arts other than jujitsu, but one, and I, I go back to Seki, one of the things he really stressed was control. Uh, you had to be able to control what you do, and you had to be able to control your attacker. Uh, and okay, maybe I've really, my, maybe my disadvantage, I've really only studied one martial art, jujitsu as encompassing as it is. But um, one of the things Seki taught was, you know, you can vary, you can control a person's pain, you can control with leverage, you can, you can control a person, you, you, in many cases, you don't have to injure them. Now that doesn't sell, that doesn't sell books or videos as much as doing nice clean throws and all that other, you know, strikes and kicks and joint locks that have the person screaming in pain but one of the things he stressed and one of the things he did teach was you need to separate pain from injury and if you can control a person with pain you can you can create a lot of pain in a person without actually injuring them uh, they may be in there think they're in a horrible joint lock and it's killing them 
but because you've had it done to you, you know by how they're moving and how they're reacting as to how much pain they're in and whether or not you're actually going to cause a joint dislocation or things of that sort. And, and that is control. And that's, that's, you know, one thing that Seki or his way he taught jujitsu, he really stressed was, you know, you, you know, um, I, I've used it. I've never, I, I could say I've never injured a student or never injured a person in a street situation. They may have complained about the pain, but there's no injury. And I think that plays into whether you want to consider dirty techniques, you know, you know, what do you mean you're going to cause a person a lot of pain? How dare you do that? That's so cruel. Well, to me, it's a lot less cruel to do that than to, you know, dislocate a person's shoulder, uh, which is easier to do. Um, and, and I think that, you know, dirty, dirty technique is what's dirty is the context in which other people interpret what you've done. Um, you know, probably based on how lively, loudly your attacker is screaming that he's in pain, um, not to be facetious. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that's, I, I, and, and there are a lot of things I know we do not teach our students because they are considered dirty. a key turn, which is this one, you know, uh, there's, there's a slight way of burying it. Do one thing before you do that, where once, if you do it, you will break the person's neck. Okay. And if we're a responsible teacher, we might only teach that difference, that slight movement difference to our upper belts, rather than the people we're not sure, you know, where they're at yet in the martial art. And there are probably a, a number of techniques like that where we will show it one way. Just, I, I, my opinion, my, my reference is uh, I'll show it one way, mainly to protect the uke from injury. Because <laughs> I was just going to say that a lot of a lot of things I think got that way, and that ties into one of the topics about ukemi uh, later on is uh, I think in a certain way, the arts got modified so that they can be done against a partner. Right. 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 Like you, you have to put somebody in a chokehold that they're able to execute uh, a counter to, you know, if you, there's no lesson to be learned in, in the technique you can't get out of. So you start teaching them so they can be, um, you know, reversed or countered and that becomes those techniques. And even, um, you know, like an original jujitsu throw, the person's supposed to land on their face, right? Not in a forward roll, <laughs> you know? You don't want your opponent to be able to roll out or land softly or anything. And then over time you do, but there used to be that like, but don't do it like this on the street, you know, on the street, do it more like this. And um, even like, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you preserve the throat press, you know, to press somebody back to get out of something, just go straight on them. A lot of schools will use the palm heel to the chin and gently press that back. And that's just kind of like alluding to what you're really doing. You right. know what I mean? Right. Um, I, I will, it, you know, I will, if, if, you know, you just take your middle finger, put it there. If you want the person to go backwards, you push towards the back of their head. If you want them to go down, you get behind, we call this a jugular notch. God put that there for us. And mm -hmm. you just push down behind there and the person goes down. And right. it's amazing how many students will try it on themselves and they gag, which is a normal response. Um, on the other hand, it's I also teach it, even to my new students, that if you just do this with a strike back, it will collapse the larynx. And now they're in a, you know, potentially fatal, person's in a potentially fatal situation. And then I also have to teach with, if you do that, here's what you can do to try to, you know, un- collapse the larynx so they can breathe at least until paramedics get there to help them you know um 
which is basically the same how you as how you treat a broken nose initially, you know, with your thumbs and trying to get everything straightened out somewhat. Um, and that's really all you can do. But if you if you teach one, you've got to teach. I think is a responsible sense if you teach how to seriously injure a person, you know, where it could be fatal, you also have to teach them, here's what you do next, because you have, you know, you know, you have to realize, yeah, if they're choking you and you do, they're trying to kill you, and this is your alternative, it's reasonable force. But you still, you know, morally, there's a moral obligation. You don't really want to kill this person. You're just trying to get them off you. Now, does that make it a dirty technique? No. Right. Um, it was funny. There was an old uh, an old jujitsu book from like 1910, 1920, something like that. The original, there's two versions of it. There's one that came out in like 1910, and then there's a reprint print from like 1960 and the original book has two chapters at the end one chapter is on basically how to kill people and the other chapter is on how to bring them back to life yeah so the one chapter is pressure points all over the body you know the striking point chart that you've seen a million times you know um and it's just talking about how to hit those spots and what'll happen and that if you hit somebody in one with a blunt thing they'll get knocked out and poke them and it does different things and then the last section is, um, uh, what is it called? Kwatsu? Kwat? Kwatsu? Something like that. It's basically Kwatsu. CPR. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's essentially the CPR, you know, yeah. resuscitation Resus parts. Resuscitation techniques. Right. And by 1960, there's a little, uh, a little blurb in the front of the book that says, this book has been published absolutely intact except for we removed the last two chapters because we don't think the public has any use for that. And I think that's where things started changing. You know, even in jujitsu books, they used to talk about it. Here's how to really hurt someone while you're doing these things. And then the publishers were like, well, that's not, that's not something we want to publish anymore. Um, and then subsequent reprints, that stuff's gone. You have to find the old one. And so there's there's definitely whether it's dirty or not, I guess a better word for it is censored techniques, yeah. right? The, They're techniques the, that have been, we've been forced to remove somehow. Yeah. The the resuscitation techniques, surprisingly, and there are some jujitsu, a couple of jujitsu systems that actually teach it a lot of them, is that at least in the United States, if you attempt to use these and things do go south you can get in trouble for using those resuscitation techniques because they're not accepted by the AMA or whatever other legal entity there is in this country as a means of resuscitation. Uh, you know, so, you know, I say you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, <laughs> hey guys, I got, a, I got a question for you. That leads to a, a different pop topic. I don't want to stray too far off what you're talking about but we're doing a lot about a, a lot of talking a lot of conversation on on being hard to kill are we comfortable on being hard to prosecute and hard to convict are, are we really up to date on on what the legal uh self-defense laws are in, in in the different jurisdictions um you know i i just kind of posed that question to the group as a generalization i i don't think I don't think most martial arts instructors are. Uh, I think I think there are some that, um, and also there's no clear. A lot of it's situational. That I mean, you you, you do have laws on the books, and different states have different criteria as to what reasonable force is. Uh, and, and that's one of the problems that law enforcement is facing too. What is reasonable force? Depends on the state, depends on the situation. You know, there, there are all these variables in there that uh, make it different, difficult to say, oh, there's no clear cut line. Let me put it that way. So uh, if, if, you know, I just make this offer to the group. If, if there's an interest in kind of learning the general techniques as a, a general national standard, and then for you to take back 
into your individual states and 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 learn what those state standards are, um, let me know and I'll be happy to to put something together. Um, uh, you know, for the group, uh, we can do it in this forum or we can do it in a side forum. Um, if there's an interest in in learning what some of those laws of self defense are, uh, by all means, let me know. I'll put my. I'll yeah, put my I, email I, in the I, I'd love it. I mean, even if it's just for my own personal personal growth. I I know, like you know, uh, I just read a what state was it? Uh, it was online this morning. Uh, I think someone it was a shooting incident, car to car shooting incident, and the the person who had the had the gun actually got off out of the charge because it, oh stand your ground, yeah. which is in some states and not in others. Uh, you know, so yeah, I I would be interested because uh, I think it would be very valuable. Uh, because it's something, it's something, you know, how you say that? It, it may not be simply black and white, but it's better than looking at a gray piece of paper. Do you understand what I'm saying, Larry? Ab absolutely. So yeah. if, the, if the group is interested in, in, in going that way, um, uh, I can certainly put something together for you. Um, and, and, and based on one of the, it's going to be based on one of the um, lead uh, national self-defense experts, a, a self-defense attorney. Andrew Baranka, I think his name is. He's got a lot of stuff on YouTube. Um, you know, I, I can kind of compile some of the you know stuff into a into a brief presentation to kind of give you guys a better idea of where to go. And then you can also share that with your students if you like. Who is who is this by? I think it's Andrew Baranka, and I'm probably saying the name wrong. The last name. He's on YouTube. I can I can forward. No, there's, uh, there's, I, I can. Uh, yeah, that's the guy there. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. That's in there. Not, uh, I mean, the material he has is fantastic, but you know, you know, as instructors, your pe your personality is what's going to, uh, or how you present, uh, determines your audience's receptiveness. Yeah, and you have to know your audience as well. Yes, so that's, you have that's to know your audience as well. Point. Yes. Um, and I got this from one of my black belts, and I'm very slowly going through it, um, simply because it has nothing to do with the material. It's just the presentation. Presentation, and, right? Uh, it's it's how do you say it's it's. Uh, I have. Yeah, it's pardon? Pardon. yeah. I, I want one thing I want to go back with with respect to not with respect to Larry per se, but someone is mentioning that you know we have to teach holds that you can get out of. There are, and I'm sure most of you know understand the concept of proper holds, uh, which the only way you get out of it is by injuring yourself. And even in jujitsu, there are only a very few what are called proper holds. Uh, and uh, everything, what your ability to get out of any hold is entirely contingent at what to how securely that hold is set at that particular point in time. And uh, but there are, you know, there are there are holds, control holds that the only way you're going to get out of is by injuring yourself um, which all students seek to avoid um, and uh, anyway okay we're are here do anyone want to do anything else with with what I what we didn't touch up is what makes the philosophical question what takes what makes a technique dirty anyone want to that social uh, we're talking about dirty techniques versus what's legal or not. What's well, I guess the opposite of a dirty technique is a clean technique. Uh, okay. <laughs> or, but th a, there, a, there are three categories, a, aren't? A, a prop. A, what's a proper technique? One that's I guess that's socially acceptable. I don't. I don't know what the definition of you know. I know a dirt. I don't even know what dirty technique is. So how do you? determine what a clean technique is or socially acceptable or um, I, I know I know that law enforcement there are certain techniques that are 
socially acceptable and socially not acceptable. I'm trying to be very tactful for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but as far as a civilian is concerned, you know, law enforcement people, depending upon the, dependent upon the agency and, and either the community or the state, some of them have a lot of restrictions as to what they can and cannot do. And civilians aren't necessarily bound to those exact same restrictions because it's a, it's a different uh, scenario generally. As I say, when I've worked with law enforcement I, or I've dealt with the public and you know, they're saying, well, the police are doing this. I say, well, you have to realize, number one, most perpetrators are not trying to fight the police. They're trying to get away in most situations. Secondly, the police are authorized by law to physically detain a person. That's their job, if need be. Okay, so they're not in the same situation where you have to defend yourself. It's an entirely different scenario. And that, that takes some people aback because they, they don't think of law enforcement like that. Uh, and it's a hard concept. Now, it, that doesn't mean that there may be some police officers that abuse their powers. There are people in every profession that abuse their powers. You know, it's not unique to law enforcement. Um, but it, you have to, sometimes you have to see what constraints the other side or what, what rights the other side, and I shouldn't use the word other side, that's not the correct because that infers opposition. What rights or powers does law enforcement have that civilians do not? And what things can civilians do that maybe law enforcement personnel in certain jurisdictions cannot do or should not do? Okay. And so philosophically what makes a technique dirty well to answer that last question or second to the last question uh the biggest difference is civilians are usually defending themselves law enforcement is aggressive uh, they're they're pursuing somebody rather than defending against somebody I, I, I know the situations vary and they're often saying they are defending themselves, but they are pursuing someone. Yes. It, uh, civilians are usually defending themselves. Yes. And the, the law is much more lenient to uh, a 100 pound female than it is to a 200 pound male. Uh, s simply because they look at it and say, okay, well, you, you can do a lot more to defend yourself. So uh, poke them in the eyes, grab them by the groin. Uh, all of that's fair and legal. But if I'm doing that to uh, somebody half my size, I, God, no jury is going to be sympathetic to me. If it's the other way around, sure, they will. Uh, I've taught in two different states. And I've had lawyers in my classes. They've described what you can and cannot do, and what and they've said it's very variable depending upon the situation. And they said, "Yeah, you're female, you're small, you're a kid. You can get away with a hell of a lot more than you can if you're uh, a male and you're big." Okay, uh, and and you move <laughs> further, further south, uh, which unfortunately I did, um, you hit the, the stand your ground uh, uh, rules and somebody can be running off your property away from you and you can shoot them in the back. That's okay. That's fine. You're defending yourself. Uh, I can kind so of chime the rules in. vary from place to place. They vary by situation. They vary by who it is, who's involved and who, who's the aggressor and who's the attacker. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, we didn't talk about dirty techniques. I, I told people, look, you do whatever you need to do. If you're in a self-defense situation, go for it. Poke them in the eyes, 
stick your finger up their ass. I don't care what you do. Uh, it, you, know, you do whatever you need to do to get out of there. The one thing that the, that the lawyers uh, in both states said is that once that person has stopped the attack, you can't keep going because that's the place where now you're in legal jeopardy. Right. That was two states out of 50. I don't know what the other 48 do. Yeah. I, 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 on to, I, but... let, me, let me respond to what Tom said. Uh, a couple of things and we're going, uh, first of all, yes, law enforcement is the aggressor, but it's because they're authorized to be the aggressor for sure. law. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's a clear, that's the only clarification I want to make, you know, so they, that's within their right, but they do have a lot of constraints that they have to work within. Yeah. So I, on, that, on that point, on that point, that used to be true, but we're seeing the stats now kind of change. And so now more and more people are wanting to fight with the police and, and yeah. attack the police. Yeah. So we're seeing that. So that's that's been something that's been changed based on the social political climate over the last few years that we've been seeing. So there's a lot of points on this, and, it, and we're opening up a whole new can, uh, <laughs> a whole new can of worms, really. Um, if you have questions on law enforcement, I'm, I'm more than happy to stick around and, and continue the conversation and just really make it a, a Q&A rather than me just kind of you kind of ramble on for you guys if you want. But if you have specific questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to kind of sit around and, and address your issues. The standard for use of force is always going to be reasonable and necessary. And the same the same rules apply to police as they do to civilian populations. The law is the law, and it, and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't distinguish between that. The only thing is that we grant police officers authority, and we have expectations for them to do things. As such, they have liability in civil um, – they have civil liability – and also, um, also they receive a lot more training than the general public. That's why you hear a lot of time, leave it to the police, because the police know how to do it. They have the equipment to do it. They have the resources to do it, even in an off-duty capacity. Uh, you know, if you cannot get involved, they encourage you really tactically not to get involved because you don't have backup. You don't have a partner. You don't have a radio. You don't have extra ammunition. You don't have all the non, uh, the less than lethal, uh, you know, force options uh, right. available as well. So the, it opens up a whole new can of worms. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, Larry is correct. The situation has changed in the last few years. There are people who are aggressors who will fight the police. Um, and then, of course, you've got, you know, video cameras, which really changes things. And maybe hopefully in the future will clarify things. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to put that down as a future topic, use of force, uh, because I think it's something we need to clarify to the best of our ability. Um, and I forgot what the other topic was. I was going to come back on Thomas on comment on. Um, <laughs> it's off into the sunset. It's okay. It'll, it'll pop up again. It, when my brain cells connect, it'll pop up. Um, I think uh, a lot of times, I think the more I'm kind of thinking about it, like when is something dirty? Is anything dirty, right? What's dirty? <laughs> um, and I think there's a couple of ways to look at it, right? Like from my perspective, nothing is dirty. It's just getting a technique to work. And, you know, like we were saying, I think we all agree with that. Like we don't personally think it's dirty to pull somebody's hair or push their finger if you need to, right? Um, but somebody is telling us it is, you know, you don't teach that stuff all the time and and all of that and i'm starting to think some of it comes down to um i think why people find it dirty i think the same technique can be dirty or not dirty and it, it becomes a uh how it's seen right like if um if you come running at me and i kick you in the face i defended myself and wow he's flexible but if you attack me and I give you a hip throw, you're on the ground and you're like, oh, my God, that really hurt my back. I'm done. I'm done. And then I kick you in the face. That's dirty. Right. Um, and nobody's celebrating anything about my kick. They don't care how good my technique was or that I got with just the right targeting and all of that. Like, um, and the same thing, I think it comes down to like maybe being necessary, but also sufficient. Like it's got to be. Yeah, that's that's it, it, that's going to be the fine line there. Reasonable yeah, and necessary. Like, so if you did a hip throw and took someone to the ground, then that's reasonable and necessary, right? But if right. you do an I extra stop. punch, 
then that's illegal because that's excessive force. That would be not right. reasonable and not necessary mm -hmm. to control the situation or to defend yourself. So really that's the standard right. you want to kind of, you know, kind of use. If you start getting carried away based on emotion and anger, um, then that's right. problematic. And that's what we see the problems happen. Right. Like if I poke your eyes with my car keys, that's not dirty. If that's like what I did to stop you. But then once you stopped and I poke you in the eyes with your car keys, no, I'm under the circumstances, right? if you're, you know, a hundred pound right. female defending right. yourself, you know, coming to your, to your car from a parking lot from the store uh, against a, a larger male suspect, then that's not reasonable and necessary. But if you're a grown man and you do this to a 13 year old kid, right. <laughs> right. Right. It was, the exactly. right? So it's all circumstantial. Hey, be, before, before we end, because we're getting there, uh, I remembered what I was going to tell Thomas. And I know I've told Thomas this a couple, three years ago when I was at his house. There, there is a book that came out on flashlight techniques. I forgot who wrote it. Uh, it's, yeah. it's that the flash, flashlight techniques are good. But in the back of the book, there are court cases, there are charts, there are graphs that determine, will help you determine what is reasonable force the reasonable use of force based on sex, age, height, weight, all these factors. And the charts are really clear and understand. And from my understanding, many of them are still being used in courts of law. Uh, they've kind of become a standard. And uh, I, I, it's, it's a paperback book. It's about three eighths of an inch thick, I think. Uh, if you remember that book, can you uh, can you send me send it to me? I'd be interested in seeing it. If if I can, I I should have a copy, I should have a copy somewhere about something. Find it. If you come across it, just uh, send me the title. Yeah, because it, it's 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 a the back part of that book is an excellent resource. Yes. fantastic. And uh, uh, I think any martial arts sensei should read that part just because it's it's a good education. Because you can't draw a blank check on what's reasonable force, and you know the, the standard varies on kind of the situation and a whole bunch of other factors. Okay, I've been to court on it once, <laughs> you know, and, and fortunate, you know, I really felt sorry for. I, essence, I felt sorry for the defendant because I think his court-appointed attorney did a lousy job, um, but that's my opinion. <laughs> sensei if i can share a quick story um about what's considered a dirty technique go ahead um so uh when i was in japan this last time uh i was in a sword shop in kyoto and um uh, looking over the sword exhibits and and stuff they sell stuff they just it's part museum part store uh, type of thing and they were having a talk there too about the history <laughs> the right. flashlight one yeah so they're they're having a talk about the history of the sword and and one of the things that i found interesting is culturally in the old days they considered the sword really any weapon as evil you know by nature because it can only do harm. It can only hurt people or kill people. So, so the weapon itself is considered evil. And what makes it noble or good is uh, a person that is trained in violence, <laughs> that knows how to use it. So there's a difference between a violent person doing violent things and a person that's trained in violence to stop violence. And depending on whose hand the sword is in, it's either evil or good. <laughs> so it's really kind of the same thing as far as, you know, what's a dirty technique. It's the wielder and their intention. Okay. The, the, the book is Defensive Tactics uh, by John G. Peters. Uh, yeah, I just found it. It's on Amazon. It's like $90 on Amazon. $90? Yeah, that's crazy. It's getting up there. I'll see if I can find it somewhere else. Uh, geez. And I thought, I, yeah, I got some of my books. Are, you want my <laughs> like Jute book? It's it's being sold in some places for $3,000. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it took me a long time to find one that wasn't. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, this is this is a it, I, I think for a serious martial arts instructor, particularly if you're teaching self-defense classes, $90 is cheap. Um, if it saves you, if, if it helps educate you and saves you from uh, uh, some legal consequences. Because someone can come back to you and say, oh, I'm going to hold my instructor responsible, legally responsible for what I did because he taught me to do this. And, and even if you win, it's going to be very expensive for you uh, in terms of attorney's fees. I mean, that's a sad commentary, but that's why if you, if, even if you teach a two-hour self-defense class, you have to have a participant agreement that, where they agree that you know, you're not responsible for what they use. Anyway, but that's a novelty different, purposes. That's a different issue, yes. Anyway, um, I think we're going to stop here because we're getting into almost two hours. And next week, we can, next two weeks, uh, or the it's 18th, be the first Saturday in April, which I think is, I hope it's not April Fool's Day. Um, it is. It is. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> How appropriate. Well, we'll see. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, like I said, there there are some books that are there are some books that are well worth the investment. Um, and uh, or. You know, it, it'd be nice to say, well, just find someone who is willing to uh, uh, copy the last X number of pages for you. Uh, I know as, as a school teacher, there was some leeway in copyright laws in terms of you were using them for educational purposes solely in the classroom. Uh, you could duplicate a certain amount of information without running afoul of copyright laws. But again, that's another issue. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it becomes dirty if you do more. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so why, why don't you have a good weekend? And uh, I will get this up. It may take a, a few days. We're in the midst of our insurance company. Uh, they have taken everything out of our pantry, dining room, living room. Uh, we have new drywall that has to come in, painting, cabinetry, carpet, carpeting. Uh, the insurance company is up to about 15000 right now. Plus, we have to buy a new refrigerator. That's at our own expense because that's what caused the problem. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's been an, it's been an, this, this happened over the Christmas holidays. So we've had an interesting uh, three months. Uh, right now we can't all our food is packed away in boxes by the insurance company we there it's out in a pod in the driveway <laughs> oh. we're eating out a lot for next week anyway <laughs> life goes on um but i'm saving the receipts because i'm going to hit the insurance company up for this uh <laughs> just going to say that's going to make up the cost right there 15 grand in food Yes, you could. Yes, we could do. We could eat very nicely up there if we wanted to, but you know, you don't want to abuse. You don't want to. You don't want to be dirty and abuse your powers. That's right. <laughs> anyway, okay. Have a great weekend. Don't do anything dangerous, and uh, we'll see you back here on April Fool's Day, I guess. Anyway, take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank you for a great, great conference today.